Hello, everyone, and welcome to the journey to multifamily millions. I'm your host, founder and CEO of Zon Investments, Tim Little. And on today's show, I'm excited to have with us Lee Johnson. Lee is the co-founder and vice president of Value Investment Partners, VIP, and is responsible for implementing strategic methods to grow VIP and help partners grow their wealth using various alternative investment strategies. He has been investing in real estate since 2005 through multifamily, private lending, and rehabbing residential properties. His focus now is passive investing through real estate syndications and active multifamily investing. His current portfolio spans multiple markets around the country with over 2,800 units valued at about 334 million. Lee, welcome to the show. Tim, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, and it's great to have you here. So I gave everyone a very high level overview of your background, but on this show, we really like to get down to the details on how you got started on your journey to multifamily millions. So please tell us a little bit more about yourself and what brought you into the multifamily space? You know, I'm going to age myself just a tad bit, but I started watching videos on real estate investing from the Carlton Sheet days. I don't know how old you are, but if you are in my bracket, then you might remember it. Right? There would be a guy named Carlton Sheets who would come on TV and Carlton would tell you, oh, you can buy multi you can buy real estate for no money down, right? So I bought the videos. I didn't have much money at the time, but somehow I was able to scoundrel up enough money to buy the videos and I watched them over and over. And that put in me passion for what real estate could actually do, you know? So after college, you know, I bought my first home in 2000 and that house, a appreciated in value significantly between that time in 2005 when I sold it, I basically sold it for 3x what I had purchased it for. And that was the opportunity for me to reach freedom, right? Because I was, you know, like many people saddled with some student loan debt and I paid that student loan debt off. And with the extra money, I went and bought some rentals in Delaware, et cetera, with some family. Long story short, that was around 2005, 2006. We crashed and burned during the 2008, you know, everything was going up. We were in the wrong way. That's one of the things that when I talk about investing with family, make sure that, you know, you've treated it like a business and you have the proper structures in place and how decisions are going to be made, especially when you're working with family, because you don't want during times like this, you know, to not be in a position where you're not speaking to your family member. But that was during 2008, 2009. I had a brief stint where I went overseas to work and, you know, my credit was impacted with the foreclosures in 2008, 2009. And being overseas for five years allowed for me not to one, request any new additional credit, but also it gave me the opportunity because I was working and I was collecting per diem to save a significant amount of money while I was overseas, right? And when I came back, you know, after, you know, five years, two of those were in South Africa, another 18, 19 months was in Singapore. And then we finally finished that tour with a Costco implementation in Issaquah, Washington. Right after five years of not having to pay for myself to live, I had saved up a significant amount of money, but also I returned to the United States with my wife, right? And, you know, she's from Botswana and she had to go through all of her immigration, et cetera. So we were looking for business ideas that we could invest this capital that we had sitting in this bank account that was really doing next to nothing. So we explored franchises and franchises didn't work for us because I didn't want to have a 12, 10, 12, 15% partner in my business or for my gross revenues. So the franchise model wasn't going to work for me there. We said, hey, let's get back into real estate. So we took a real estate boot camp class over here in Virginia. And you know, I walked up to the instructor and I told the instructor at that point in time, I said, hey, 
I'm going to be the first student out of this class to do a deal. And I still gave myself one month, but inside of that boot camp class, there was everything that I needed. There was hard money lending. There was a wholesaler. There was a contractor. There was a realtor. I had everything that I needed in that room. And within 14 days, we were under contract and we had secured our first deal. And that first deal, you know, went according to plan, you know, two months to do a renovation. Within a week, we had put that property on the market. We had multiple offers uh, around that time. It was around 2014. We had multiple offers and we took the highest one and we sold that property. We had a couple of little things that we had to run into with some inspections, et cetera, but we sold that property. And since we had figured out the model, we figured, hey, let's go and do this. So my wife went and got her realtor's license and we started doing more flips and she started selling them. But what we ran into, because I still had my employment and, you know, I'm, I was a high net, high income employee, I realized that as this employee, all of the monies that we were making weren't taxed at capital gains. And I thought that it was going to be taxed at capital gains. And what I came to realize was, no, it's going to be taxed at my income level. So basically, this was additional income that the IRS hadn't saved any money or well, taken out any taxes. So at that point in time, I was doing all of this difficult and hard, stressful work. The re net result of it was that I was sending a check over to Uncle Sam. And I kept looking and asking myself, should I continue to do more fix and flips? And I started to say, no, because the reason why I got into real estate was to reduce my taxes. And upon that epiphany, I came to the conclusion that I need to go into real estate, multifamily for sure, right? Buy and hold, but I didn't want to be a landlord where I was looking after single family rentals or duplexes. If anything, I would have done a quadplex because I said to myself, if I had to start all over, if I get that question today, if I had to start all over, what would I do? The thing that I would do is I would buy a quadplex and I would live in one and I would rent the other three, right? So we started looking in our area. We're over here in the Washington, D.C. metro. And of course, this is a tier one, tier one MSA. And there are a lot of highly educated people. The incomes are high. It meant that if I wanted to purchase a multifamily nearby, it was going to cost me significantly. Even today, if you look at properties in the Washington, D.C. corridor, they're probably averaging about two hundred and fifty to $300,000 per door. So I said to myself, it was going to be difficult for me to purchase something within driving distance of my home. And that's when... I read It's a Whole Different Business by Gene Tobridge, right? And I read that book and that book opened my mind to say, oh, there's something called syndications. I knew that there had to have been something, right? I just didn't know what that name was. And I said, oh, this thing here, I can, you know, find out, leverage these to understand how this all works. And at that point in time, I wasn't familiar with any operators, right? I didn't know of any operators, but I found Realty Shares. And on Realty Shares, which is now defunct, I went on to Realty Shares and what I would do is I would read PPMs. I would download the PPM and I would read it front to back, cover to cover. And sometimes a PPM could be a hundred pages. And I probably, at that point in time, I probably had read 30 to 50, probably closer to 50, but it opened up my eyes into how the syndications work. And of course, an operating memorandum can tell you anything. A PPM cannot lie. So I got to learn all of the business from the PPM and studied those. And by the time I had moved into my first syndication, Right outside of Realty Shares as a platform, I probably had read north of 75 different PPMs because that was my textbook into learning how this business was going to work. 
And it became beneficial because I knew what to look for inside of a deal, sources and uses and how the money is going to be used for. I looked at the fees that are going to be charged and I knew how to compare an apple to an orange, et cetera. I looked for the fact that you had to have a preferred return, right? A deal without a preferred return is a preferred return is a deal that I pass on because I believe that it's not going to look out for the LP investors. So that's a little bit about the story as to how we got into investing in multifamily syndications. It was a journey of try this, try that, experiment, fall down, get back up, dust yourself off, and then continue to go forward. And even still today, I'm always learning about different ways that I can continue to grow my business. And what I try to do is I try to share the information with others so that, hey, people don't like to read like I like to read. I absolutely love to read. A book is my best friend, but a book opens up my eyes to a different possibility, a different strategy that I wasn't familiar with. And then I try to bring that to my community to say, hey, were you familiar with this? Like, when we ran into Robert R. Nelson Nash and becoming your own bank, I could, my next meetup, I had to speak about, you know, privatized banking, infinite banking, et cetera. And I told people that this is the best thing since sliced bread. If you like real estate investing, you're definitely going to love doing this. So eventually that's what we did is we, built out value investment partners such that it's a circle or a flywheel per se of different things that you can do at different stages, right? Because you're always going to meet people at different stages of their investing journey. And we have something that we believe will help everyone at the different stages of their journey, whether that's leveraging whether that's leveraging whole life insurance policies or universal index life life insurance policies in order to be in a position where that person is able to grow in two places at the same time. But once that cash value has reached a certain amount where you can invest it in the multifamily syndication, even better, now that policy is growing at double the rate. There's no other I've searched high, I've searched low, I've searched far and I've searched wide for opportunities such as the privatized banking and I haven't found one better yet. Growing wealth in two places at the same time is awesome. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say, we'll definitely talk about that more, but what a great story there. And, And I wanna go back to the beginning, you know, Real estate, like like anything else, is about cycles, right? There's mm. we go through different cycles, and you found yourself, you know, lucky in one sense that you came in when it was on that upswing when you were introduced to it, and you were able to really capitalize on the appreciation in that first property, which mm-hmm. I'm sure gave you a lot of confidence in real estate as an asset. That's usually when people first see that massive value there. They're like, wow. All I did was live in this thing and the value grew, you know, three times, which is a lot. It's more than I've seen on a lot of properties. So after that, you were, I, don't, I wouldn't say all in because you were still working, but you saw the potential there and then, you know, started investing more at a less fortunate time, right? Right, right before the crash. And, you know, like so many people, so many other people, you, you got hurt by that, right? You fell victim yeah. to that crash. But what I love is the fact that, you know, after learning some lessons and maybe some time going by and you educating yourself more, you got back up and you said, no, real estate is still the thing. It, that is the best route to financial freedom or however you want to pull it. It's, there's definitely an opportunity there that you saw regardless of that impact that the crash had on you, you didn't let it just, you know, 
sway you away from real estate, which I think is a lot more than could be said for a lot of people, you know, whether it's crypto, real estate, anything else, as soon as they hit a rough patch, they push that asset to the side and move on to the next thing, whatever that next shiny object is. So there's a lot of people pushing that crypto off to the side right now. FTX is, has shown a lot of people that, Hey, this isn't as, as lofty and as attractive as I thought it was, but that's what happened with the tulips, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we could search through history and see these lessons over and over again. And, you know, I won't get into crypto too much. I still have some, but I'm leaving it. <laughs> I'm leaving it right where it is, you know, just in case it doesn't go to zero at this point. Cause what do I have to lose? Right. At this point. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you, you lose when you sell, it's just like a stock. So no, no point in selling at the bottom, but I wanted to talk about some of the other pieces you said in there, like you said, a, you know, going into these markets, timing makes a difference. We're at a much different place now, obviously, but the first aspect of real estate that you really started to get a tremendous amount of success it sounds like is the whole fixing and flipping which is kind of the natural starting point i think for a lot of people and i don't know whether that's because of tv because it's tv yeah <laughs> okay fair i don't want to make assumptions but hgtv has done more for flipping than probably anything else right there you go so there you have it it was as i suspected and, but there are some merits to it, but then you talked about some of the downsides as well. I think the value in flipping, and I haven't really done it myself, but the value is getting money quickly, right? These are not five, seven or 10 year holds. You're holding it for, you know, a few months, a year, and you're getting that money quickly. But funny enough, that's also its downside in return in terms of how it's viewed from a tax perspective. It is not taxed advantage because you're getting those funds so quickly. The IRS doesn't like that. And they say, no, you're moving too quickly. You're not contributing you know, to, to real housing. This is you just making a quick buck. So they say, hey, we'll, we'll take a nice fat percentage of that quick buck. And it sounds like that's what you ran into. Tim, the government will always be your partner, right? But when I ran into this conundrum and I was asking different CPAs, how does it work? How does this work? How should I do this? How do I do that? And you know, they gave me a whole bunch of consulting answers, which is it depends, right? And what I learned from that is I needed to have a conversation with a book right? And a colleague told me about Will Wright's Tax-Free Wealth. And I read that book as though it was candy. I kept going to chapter after chapter. And Tom, in that book, he speaks to when the government wants to incentivize and have you do something a certain way, you should listen. And one of the two things that the government wants investors to do for the most part. The first one is create jobs. Everyone knows that the government likes for businesses to create jobs. The second one that I don't believe a lot of people spend a lot of time thinking about is the government wants you to create housing, right? That's the second most incentivized thing that the government wants you to do. So in reading Tom Wilwright's book, I learned that basically the tax code at that point in time of the writing of the book was about 6,000 pages. And Tom points out that about 200 of those pages are about how the government is going to tax you as an individual. The other 5,800 pages of the book talk about different ways that the government is incenting you to do certain things that they want you to do. 5,800 pages. So I said to myself, I don't want to become a tax expert, but I need to have a tax expert who can consolidate that 5,800 into things that I can do that doesn't seem like homework, right? And I get passionate about real estate because it's something that I can see. It's something that I can touch. 
I understand it without having to really think about it. So when I, you know, after that first year, we completed two or three flips and all of a sudden, when, whenever you get that 40 or $50,000 check at closing, you're like, yeah, yeah. And I was actually nervous to go and spend any of it because I was saying, I don't know what I owe the tax man. I don't know what I owe the tax man. And I'm conservative in that regard. I wanted to see, okay, let's have this thing go full circle. Gave it all to my accountant. He ran the numbers. And all of a sudden, I'm writing a five-digit check to the IRS. And I'm like, that's not fun. <laughs> That's not fun. I don't want, I don't, I didn't, do, you know, literally as you're doing the flip, you are at that property two, three times a week. And at that point in time, I had a job and I'm, you know, taking off to drive an hour to go look at the property. Saturdays, I'm at the property just to look at the progress, right? That's a lot of stress only to receive check and know that probably a third of it you're going to have to write over to Uncle Sam. And I don't dissuade people from being fix and flippers. I just say that if you're going to be a fix and flipper, you need to make less than a hundred to $150,000. If you make less than that, then you're probably okay to be able to do fix and flip because it's going to tax you at a, at your earned income bracket. But if you are anywhere north of a hundred, I say once you get to 100K, that's when you probably want to start thinking about how can I do fix and flips? And then that means that you need to do it full time where you abandon your job and you dive in and you just do fix and flips. But as you see right now, and I guess if people are doing fix and flips, the market is somewhat tight just because interest rates, I think they just went under seven, but they were over seven for a tad bit. And, you know, I think I heard when I was in the car the other day, Bloomberg had it at 6.67, which is still an enormous amount of money compared to what we have been spoiled with over the last several years, right? We're used to interest rates being in the twos and the threes and the fours. And just having a conversation about fives and sixes and sevens are interest rates that were unheard of, even for me when I got that first house in 2000, I think my rate was at five or six, right? And now we're having that conversation today. But, you know, there's a lot of debate that you have with people as to whether or not they should purchase a home. You know, in 2017, when the standard deductions were increased to what they are, what, $12,500 or twenty five for a couple, it kind of sort of disincented whether or not if you would purchase a home because now you're not itemizing your deductions. So it may not make sense. But if you are a renter, your largest expense, which is your living and accommodation expense, is not capped, right? Every year, the landlord, which I am, is allowed to increase the rents and they don't see my pro forma model, but my pro forma model has it increasing at least 2% every year, sometimes two, three or 4%. So I say to people that when you're on this wealth building journey, the first thing that you need to do is lock in on your largest expense, which is your home. And you use that to grow equity and then once you grow the equity, you start to invest it because I believe, what's the sense in saying to someone, I have $100,000 in equity in my house. I'm like, you're wasting it. You need to put take that equity out and put that money to work for you because at the end of the day, the goal should be getting to your financial independence number, right? And once that financial independence number is known, that's the number that you can use to basically generate passive income off of. And if that can cover your lifestyle expenses, I believe that, that's success. I think we have mentioned what is success. To me, that's success because at that point in time, you have freed up yourself to do anything that you please, you know, of course, within the law, right? But you get to spend your day exactly how you want to spend your day.
And to me, that's what I would define as freedom is getting to that financial independence number, right? At that point in time, that financial independence number can grow at three to 5% a year, and that can cover your annual expenses. Now your day is yours to do as you want. If you wanna travel, if you wanna paint, whatever you wanna do, that's what you can do at that point in time. And that's something that I was never taught in school, much like you, I have my undergraduate went back for my MBA and I started to say, I wanna make more money. I wanna make 400, 500, $600,000. But then I thought, wow, well, how much are they gonna tax me if I make that much money? Because then that's gonna put me in the highest bracket. I'll be in the 37% bracket for today. And those brackets expire in 2025. A lot of people don't realize that, but the tax bracket for individuals, that wasn't permanent. That was in the 2017 law, that was a, a temporary fix. So in 2025, those numbers are gonna go back up and a significant portion of what we do is based on how well we are able to plan, right? And if you're able to plan, I think you can navigate through these waters and get to where you need to get to so that we could basically be anywhere in the world where you choose to be, living the life that you wanna live. Yeah, that's de that's definitely the goal. And I think a lot of people listening are thinking the same thing. They're probably just a little earlier on in their journey, some of them, and they're not sure where to start because like, like you and I, they didn't know syndication, as an example, was a thing until they did, until you hear it for the first time, whether it's the word, whether it's the concept. So a lot of them, again, go on these same paths, you know, and I think some of it is, we talked about perspective and you know we talked about like interest rates for example a lot of that is about perspective too right like seven percent seems absurdly high but you're absolutely right we got spoiled with you know two and three percent that is not normal and i think a lot of people don't understand that who are under a certain age they think you know mortgage rates should be at three and four percent it'd be great but again, that was a complete anomaly. If you broaden your scope just a little bit, you'll be able to see that. And I'm happy I caught it when I did. And I refinanced my house at 2.65. I don't think it's ever going to get better than that. Like, <laughs> I am not fooling myself into thinking it's going to ever go that low again. Maybe it will, but not very likely. So we probably have to assume that where we're at right now is closer to where things are going to stay for at least a little while. And then, you know, with what you were saying about the IRS, a lot of that comes down to perspective too. People could choose to say, oh, well, it's not fair that I have this job and they tax me this much. And if I do this, you know, they want this percentage. Or you can look at it from the perspective of the IRS is giving you the answers to the test. They're saying, hey, here's what you should do if you want to keep more of your money. We're just saying you don't have to do it. You can continue mm -hmm. doing what you're doing and we'll continue to take out that, you know, 25, 30, 35%. 37%. Right. But if you do this other thing, I'm just saying you'll keep more of it, but people don't do it because they get used to what they're doing, whether it's their 401k, working their regular W2 job, investing in stocks, bonds, and not realizing that you know, if they do that research like you have with reading these different books that give you the answers to the tests, then they can do the same thing. You know, this, there's nothing preventing people from doing this. I also think it's interesting that we had a similar experience in the sense that after grad school, I went to DC because that's where my job was as a, a government consultant. And I wanted to get into you know, multifamily, and I was looking at small multifamily, right? I was looking at duplex, triplex. I looked around DC and I was like, oh, that's not going to work. I'm, Million I, dollars I, here. But yeah, because they needed 25% down. I didn't have 25% down to put on a $500,000, $750,000 property. So, I, you know, I wound up going to Virginia you know, and going down there and it was, you know, two hour drive, but I was able to find a duplex down there for like 
85,000, which would have been completely impossible anywhere in the DC area. So th that's how I got my start. I just thought it was interesting that, you know, some people, again, perception, they say, hey, well, there's nothing in my neighborhood, nothing in, in my area that I could possibly afford. Okay. Then look outside that circle and keep going in concentric circles until you do find something that you can't afford, even if you're just looking at something as small as a duplex or a triplex. The opportunities are out there as long as you don't allow your beliefs to get limited right at the outset. Oh, yeah. No, America is a very big place, <laughs> a very big place. And, you know, since I am still in Northern Virginia, we were thinking about, oh, let's move down to Richmond, right? Because Richmond, you know, has some more smaller multifamilies than what you have in Virginia and Maryland. And it's also a landlord friendly state, right? So if I'm giving away a little bit of my strategy, but if I'm in Richmond, Virginia, that, mean I can, that means that I can get anywhere in multiple different MSAs or submarkets, let me call them submarkets within a two hour drive. I can go east, right? I can, at that point, I can go east and I can be in Newport News, Norfolk, Virginia Beach. If I go north, I could be in Lynchburg. I could be in Fredericksburg. If I go west, I can be in Roanoke. If I go south, I can be in Greensboro. I could even spend a little bit of time in Raleigh Durham, right? So what I'm trying to do is I'm saying to myself, let me centrally locate myself where I can go and jump in a car for an hour and a half, two hour drive, and I can be in any of these sub markets, just buying up more and more real estate, more and more real estate, right? Because I understand now how to manage a property, asset managing a property, and I know what it takes to protect an investor if I'm gonna say to them, hey, I need some of your capital to put a deal together and I know what good looks like, right? Because at this point in time, we've invested in 25 different syndications, right? About 10 of those have been exits. So we know what full circle looks like. We know what it means to be an LP investor and what good looks like and what bad looks like. And we now know what the conversations are as a GP when you're on a team and you're responsible for making sure that the business plan is being executed and you're more so than anything, you are communicating with your investors. That's what is paramount for me as an LP investor is making sure that I'm being communicated to and I'm in, in both good times and in bad times. A lot of the times, if things are good, you might hear from a uh, uh, an operator, but if things are bad, they sometimes go dark on you. And that's the last thing that should happen is that the operator should go dark on you during the bad times, because that's where, you know, the investor really needed to hear from you. Yeah. And as we all know, uh, bad news doesn't get better with time. And I'm like you, if I don't hear anything that makes me more nervous, I'd rather you just, you know, send me the email whatever it is, you know, send me those updates. And yeah, I may read them in detail. I may not, but that's not really the point to me. Yeah. The point is that you're communicating with me, but as an operator myself, I've had some uncomfortable conversations because I haven't been in a deal yet that has gone 100% the way that I planned. And the thing is, I think a lot of passive investors, at least more experienced, Passive investors understand that, they know mm -hmm. that, that stuff is going to happen. So th they're not going to lose their mind if you tell them. But I think, you know, especially newer operators are afraid to have those uncomfortable conversations. And so they go radio silent. Like you said, it's probably the new passive investors that we have to educate a little bit and say, you know, hey, I know we planned for this, but now this is happening but tell them how you're reacting to it, right? If you bring someone a problem, you know, we say in the military, I say, don't bring, bring me problems, bring me solutions. Like if you're gonna tell me something is wrong, 
you better tell me what your plan is to fix it. And if you do that, then I have a much higher level of confidence in what you're doing than maybe even before that problem arose, because it shows that you're able to adapt to those situations, figure out a resolution, move on. 100%. And, you know, there no deal goes exactly as you plan, right? No one had expected that we were going to run into a pandemic and basically the world was going to have to be shut down because the last time this had happened on scale was 1918. And I don't think anybody is alive and still investing to tell us exactly how that experience was. And now, in 2020, we had that whole experience all over again. And of course, that led to inflation and inflation led to supplies, you know, being impacted, right? Because supply chains were there. So, you know, that those deals probably didn't go in the same fashion that they were. But if you did your due diligence correctly, you looked at your MSAs, you looked at your submarkets, you found out that there were places that were people were moving to based on the pandemic, right? And investing in those Sunbelt MSAs was the place to go. People were moving into Dallas, Fort Worth and Houston like nobody's business, right? People were moving from up north, New York, New Jersey, down to North Carolina, Atlanta, South Carolina, Florida, those were the places where you needed to be ahead of the curve and start investing. And the good thing about it is when I jumped in, I knew a number of operators who were operating in those districts. And guess what? We were able to, you know, get, you know, at least 1.5 equity multiple in an early time frame than we would have if we had to hold it. But now we're in a different, we're different a different market. You know, where, you know, interest rates are high and, you know, debt is what makes multifamily happen without having, you know, attractive debt on an asset, the deals don't get done. I think that's what the Federal Reserve is looking for is they want to slow down the pace, right? Capital is too easy to obtain. And when capital is too easy to obtain, it chases a deal versus the deal coming to it. Right. So I, I think that we're going to be in for it. I think the uh, the Fed, again, is going to meet first week of December. I'm forecasting that they're probably going to do a 50 basis point raise, because when you look at inflation year over year, it stopped at its peak. And now, and I believe last month, it was around 7.7%. All of these things, although they not aren't directly tied into real estate, these are factors that have to go into your analysis as you're making a decision. I'll end that point by saying the best book that I ever read on trading stocks wasn't a stock trading book. It was a book about stock trading, but it was written by a psychologist. And the psychologist basically says that preservation of capital is tantamount to everything. And the name of that book was Trading for a Living. I don't remember the author's name, but he was a psychologist. And you are under different stressors when you are in the game versus when you're sitting on the sideline. That's why so many people are fantastic at fantasy football and betting when they're playing with house money, with the funny dollars. But once they put their own money into a deal, it's a whole totally different world. And you got different factors that are now going into your decision cycle. And it's a whole different world. Yeah, and you're absolutely right that we have to forecast. That is essentially our responsibility when we're building out these deals. You know, and no one has a crystal ball. I, I get that. But I think it's a responsibility of ours to at least be aware of what's going on in markets and to you know predict based on current evidence where we think it might go. Now, that's not to say that it's gonna be 100% correct, but then you also have to stress test deals in the sense that you're saying, okay, if rates go this high or this low, if cap rates go this high or this low, 
we're still going to hit our targets for investors. And then you have to communicate that to investors. That way they understand that you've planned for, you know, what you perceive as the worst case scenario over the next, you know, two, three, five years, whatever the whole time for that deal is. Cause these are long term commitments, you know, in, in many respects. And I don't think we should expect to see the kind of returns on the same timelines that we did for the past couple of years, especially in places like the Sun Belt, you know, like here in Tampa or surrounding areas where we saw, you know, 1.8 to multiple in 24 months or less in, in some cases. And I think nowadays it's going to probably be more in line with what the actual prediction of that whole time was, be it three to five years. Probably not going to see it, you know, turn over in 18 months. It's probably be, going to be at that three-year mark, at that five-year mark, because things are a little shakier. But at the mm -hmm. same time, I think what's important to have investors understand is that deals still happen. A lot of investors are scared right now because of the uncertainty, which is completely understandable. But deals are still out there and deals are still happening. So you're either holding your cash and having it erode because of inflation, or you're putting it into something that's getting virtually no return, or you have these options out here, like these savvy operators who are still finding deals. They're having to do a lot more work to find them, but when they do, those are the opportunities for these passive investors to get in and still make very respectable returns on their money. Absolutely. And capital should be working 24 hours a day, 365, right? And if it's not, it's, it's being eroded by inflation. That's why, you know, I put together a system that says, hey, when you get back those cash flows from your multifamily syndications, how do you put it to work? You put it to work by investing it in a short term loan, right? That's going to give you seven, eight, nine percent yield on it, right? And if you're doing that money is always growing. It's a flywheel. Once it starts going, it's going to keep its momentum all on its own. So there are different things. You just got to adjust what you've been doing in previously to the current times. And you also have to think about the future just a little bit. But I agree with you. There are deals and opportunities out there. For example, uh, all of those deals, some people want to, you know, move on to other opportunities. If it has assumable debt and that assumable debt is in the twos and the threes and the fours, that's might, that might be a deal that still pencils out with conservative underwriting, right? And the last point is people have to make sure that there's a sensitivity analysis performed on the pro forma to understand well, what level of vacancies the property can support before it's not able to meet its debt service. And if that all seems to work out, then you probably have a pretty sound investment. And then you can look at the operator to make sure that that's a person who keeps their word. If the deal underwrites and is conservatively underwritten, once those, once you're past that hurdle, it's time to investigate the operator to see what their track record is. And if they have a sound track record, I think there's an opportunity to move forward. Absolutely. Doing due diligence, not only on that deal, but on that team that is going to be running that deal. So I think in addition to the fear that a lot of investors, potential investors have, another aspect is just the limiting belief that they don't have money to invest where in fact, many of them do, they're just not aware of the sources that are available to them. Can you give some examples of money that investors may have that's hiding in plain sight? One of the things that I talk to many of our investors about is leveraging their stranded 401ks, right? We are no longer in a time and age where the majority of Americans are spending their entire career with one, maybe two companies, right? So 
you can actually leverage those stranded 401ks. And by stranded 401ks, I mean is a 401k that you contributed when you were with that employer. But now that you have left, a lot of people either leave that money where it is with that current custodian or they take that 401k and they transfer it to their current employer's 401k program. The better thing, in my opinion, that person should do is they should transfer that, roll it over into something called a self-directed IRA, where there's no tax consequences at that point in time. But with a self-directed IRA, you get to control your future by making the investments that you see fit for you, right? At other times, people can, you know, do a conversion and take that 401k and roll it over into a Roth. Yeah, there's going to be some penalties that are going to hit them, but that money is then able to grow tax-free forever. You know, once, you know, Rob, Peter, pay Paul, but at the same time, you're going to be able to take control of your future by betting on yourself. So stranded 401ks and transferring that over to a self-directed IRA or an EQRP is a way that I tell people that they can do this. And if that doesn't work, like they don't have a stranded 401k, I say to them, you can put together an investment group, right? Most deals have a buy-in of a Twenty-five or fifty thousand dollars. That's an opportunity for several people to come together and say, "Hey, we want to understand what this is, but we can't get in there by ourselves." If you can work with others, you can pull your money together, create your own little syndicate there, and go and invest in a deal. That makes a whole lot of sense for a lot of people. At the same time, one of the things that people don't realize is that most deals, a five hundred six B deal, allows for thirty-five non-accredited investors to participate in that deal, right? And that's the opportunity if you're working with a solid GP team where they use those slots to work with people who have the potential to continue to invest with them and grow inside of that asset class as they move forward. Of course, when you're dealing with a 506C, it's only for accredited investors, but when you have that 506B, there's an opportunity to participate if you aren't accredited. Yeah. And I am a huge advocate for self-directed retirement accounts. I myself use a solo 401k and it was exactly the situation you're talking about. Had an orphaned 401k from my previous employer. It was just kind of sitting around in that account. And I was not happy with the lack of control that I had over it. Right. It, they're like, hey, you can invest in these 10 funds and that's your choices. And I was like, what if I don't want to invest in those 10 funds? And then of course, you know, once you discover real estate and fall in love with it, you're like, I actually want to invest all of it in real estate. I luckily found that option and, you know, have been doing it ever since. And it's nice because, you know, when you're looking at long-term investments, you know, things with a three to five year horizon, you think about it even less when you know you can't touch the money anyways. And, you know, I've already had one, I've already had that money go full cycle on one deal. That was one of those anomalies. It was like 18 months. <laughs> the deal yeah. went full cycle at like a 1.8 multiple. You won't see that again, but still it's nice to have. And so then immediately just put it into another investment. And what I did is I tried to diversify from the other investments that I was doing. You know, I primarily on the active side am doing class B value add type deals, right? So with my solo 401k, I put it into a class A, you know, may not get as high a return, but much safer and still a lot better than anything I was getting when I, I had it in the, those traditional funds. And I've also even done you know, like hard money loans with it. As long as I'm not touching the money, people don't understand the level of flexibility you have because it's literally checkbook control of these accounts. And so if people want to gain control over their own money and they have these types of accounts, these orphan 401ks, or they're they're, they know they're going to be leaving an employer, I tell everyone like, hey, get it out while you have the opportunity, roll it over, 
at no no charge, like you said, and get one of these accounts, whether it's a self-directed IRA or solo 401k, different implications from a tax yeah. perspective, depending on the type of investment, consult your tax professional. I am not a CPA or yeah. an attorney, <laughs> but yeah, as long as people educate themselves on, you know, the impacts then, and it's, again, it's not even to say that it makes the deal bad. It's just, they need to know what those impacts are. Absolutely. A fool and his money is always soon separated as the old saying that is there. And when it comes to the self-directed IRA with checkbook access, I say to people, if you trust yourself, go with the checkbook IRA, right? If you somewhat don't trust yourself and you might tap into that cash, I say you should go with a custodian and allow the custodian to vet the opportunity for you before sending the cash away. I trust myself. That's money that I didn't need to ever touch because I do have, you know, my family has a security, six months, 12 months security blanket. Should anything happen, we're going to be good for a couple of years, right? So I know I wouldn't ever go in and tap into that, my IRA LLC. So I'm comfortable with that and knowing that's going to survive, but I agree with you. If you ever look at your 401k, my 401k, I look at it and I see a record keeping fee over and over. What you have to do when you have a 401k is you have to look at the expenses that the custodian is taking from you and you have to realize how that is eroding your growth potential. And when you look at it over one year, no problem. But when you look at it over 20 years and you have 20, 30 percent that isn't able to work for you because of those fees that they've been collecting, you start to realize that, hey, the faster I can get into a self-directed or a QRP, the better off I'll be. Right. And the other thing you talked about how the the corporate environment is just different nowadays in terms of how long people stay with their employers. And I think that's an important point because some people are moving from employer to employer and then starting a new 401k at their next job, but leaving those orphaned accounts. And some people may have one or two, I don't know, maybe even three, you know, orphaned accounts that they've just lost track of because they've moved so quickly on to the next one. So, you know, my recommendation is, you know, check the proverbial couch cushions. You may find twenty five, fifty, hundred thousand dollars just lying around in there. And that's money that that could be working for you. Like you said, your money needs to be working for you 24 hours a day. You work too hard for your money to let it be lazy. So find it if you've left it kind of sitting idle and put it to work. And Tim, can I say lazy is leaving it in our traditional savings or checking account. I would implore any one of your listeners to just go on to your bank's website and see what they're offering as a savings rate. I just did this with a client of mine and we came to Bank of America (laughs) 0.01%, right? (laughs) And that was up to about a thousand dollars. And I think even if you went up to about a hundred thousand dollars in that account, you were going to get 0.05%. And in an age where inflation is at 7%, I tell people, if you're going to leave your money in that account, let me help you book a flight to Vegas so that we can party like a rock star because you should definitely be enjoying that money versus allowing inflation to eat it away. Yeah, definitely some sound advice. The only exception I would say to that is like you just talked about is having that emergency reserve, you know, whether for you that's three months, six months or or a year, depending on how conservative, you know, you are. You know, make sure you have your financial house in order, but everything else should be working. Well, Lee, I know we've been dropping a lot of knowledge bombs, but we need to move on to the turbo round right now. All right, so I'm going to go through and ask you three questions that I ask all my guests 
in quick succession, and I just ask that you give me your honest answer. The first question, what is one red flag every investor should look out for, be they passive investor or active? I, I would say that everyone needs to make sure that the OM matches up with the PPM. OM, anybody can say anything inside of the OM. The PPM is where all of the details are because that document is going to have to be filed with the SEC. So make sure that the numbers align, the people who are on the GP team, all of that aligns, etc. That needs to be synchronized. Absolutely. And just for some of the audience who isn't familiar with all those acronyms, we'll just say OM is Offering Mem Memorandum for the property, PPM, Private Placement memorandum and then i think we said gps too while we were in there and that's yeah. ge general partners all right the second question what is a myth about this business you would like to set that the operators don't deserve their fees right at the end of the day operators put together the deal they put their capital at risk in order to secure the deal while they're going through their due diligence etc I believe that the you the last thing that you want to have is a starving GP. You want to make sure that they're compensated, but you don't want their fees to be too high. Yeah, and it absolutely makes sense. But I think a lot of people just unfamiliar with the structure just need to understand that because they, they may not understand how everybody gets compensated. And so that's mm -hmm. just part of that education piece. Now, final question. And I think we we spoke about this a little bit, but remind us, what does success look like to you? Success looks like to me where you are in control of your life, right? You have the opportunity to spend your days as you see fit. If you wanna sleep in to, to 12 o'clock noon, I wouldn't prescribe that, but if you wanna sleep into 12 o'clock noon, you can do that. One of the things that I can tell you that multifamily and real estate investing as a whole has enjoyed for me is that I'm able to walk my kids to school and I'm able to pick them up after school. And that means a lot to me. So one of the things that I say is make sure that you can live your lifestyle, the one that you see fit, right? You already give eight hours of your wait time to an employer. I say, you know, set a seven to 10 year plan versus a 30 to 40 year plan to grow your network to the point where you can live off for the passive income that it generates. Yeah, exactly. And it goes back to what you said earlier, which is, you know, basically start with the end in mind, having that plan for yourself so that you know what that target is that you need to hit. All right. Hey Lee, this has been great. I really enjoyed having you on. I think we, we talked through a lot of heavy topics, but a lot of knowledge I think was shared with our guests. Please tell them how they can get a hold of you and if you have anything else that you would like to share. I'm on past I'm on social media. LinkedIn is the tool that I use. I'm a recovering professional, as they say. So you could always find us on LinkedIn at Passive REI Pros. That's the title that we use on social media. So LinkedIn is a place where you could always catch me. But you know, we have the website and it's Lee at valueinvestmentpartners.com, right? So you could always get us there. And the final one is, hey, we still have a phone number and we pick up and our partners call. It's 571-444-8474. Uh, and uh, we pick up the phone. So those are the three, four different ways that you can get in contact with us at any point in time. Awesome. All right, Lee. Well, thanks again. We will definitely have all that information in the show notes. I appreciate you coming on and look forward to you doing big things on your journey to multifamily millions. Mm -hmm.